Welcome to another installment of Fighting for the Faith. My name is Chris Roseborough. I am your servant in Jesus Christ. This is the channel that compares what people are saying in the name of God to the Word of God. Okay, this is installment number two of our two-part installment series on debunking Robert Morris's blessed life. And you already know now that if you know your covenants, you are more likely not to fall for the, the shenanigans of Robert Morris, and that's exactly what they are. This man twists scripture, but we're gonna we're gonna catch him today adding to scripture, adding things that are not there. And oh, it's it's absolutely slick the way he twists the Bible up. And one of the things that's a universal for me, I've had a lot of people uh, contact me over the years who used to attend uh, Robert Morris's church. And to a person, every one of them says, the only thing he cares about and constantly harps on is money. And boy, is he that that's really what he's all about. So as we work through this today, you're going to see that uh, not only is he twisting Exodus 13, we're going to look at the the what he considers the most important teaching in the series, the principle of the first. And notice he doesn't say commandment. He's using the phrase principle because who knows what that means. I've found a principle in the Bible, and if you follow this principle, I assure you that certain results are going to happen in your life, but I'm the first guy to discover the principle. Yeah, the issue is, is that uh, when we're talking about God's Word, we need clear commands of God to guide us in what w what is the will of God. Finding so-called principles to follow is no way to create a command that by then you bind people's consciences. So let's let's do this. Let's uh, whirl up the desktop and uh, head over to our web browser. And uh, what I wanted to do was uh, show you just, I mean, how absolutely duplicitous this man is. And the, you know, the false teaching that he teaches at the end of the day can be summarized in this little snippet from like the original Blessed Life teaching series, and listen to what he says here, and uh, of course we'll react accordingly. The reason is because there's a test, and you need to know about it. And the great thing is, if you pass the test, you're blessed. If you fail the test, you and your family are under a curse. <laughs> <laughs> said with a straight face. So uh, remember the, the first video we talked about the importance of passing that test. And according to Robert Morris, if you fail this test, what test? Well, the test of are you going to tithe to, uh, you know, to your church immediately? First check you write. If you don't pass that test, bad news is you, your finances, your family, you're all under a curse. Hog wash. That's what we call balagna. And that is not what the scripture says at all. And again, Christians are not under the Mosaic Covenant's command to tithe. So you can see what's at stake here. You sit there and go, oh no. Oh, if I don't write a check to Robert Morris, 10% off, off the gross immediately, first check, ah, then my finances are going to be cursed. No. That's not what scripture teaches at all. So today we're focusing in on the so-called principle of the first. If you want to open up to Exodus 13, that's going to be the primary text here. And again, like yesterday, since we have a large portion of this video teaching that we want to go through, what we're going to do is we're going to bump up the speed just a little bit, not a lot, just enough to kind of keep the pace moving so it doesn't drag. And uh, and we'll, we'll interact with the biblical text along the way. And and um, he, what's interesting is that Robert Morris, as you know, as a teacher of God's word, either seems to be ignorant of the book of Deuteronomy's use of Exodus 13 and how it gets its resolve, or he's just ignoring it. It's one or the other. Either way, it doesn't really bode well for him as a teacher in Christ's church, but let's take a listen. And I want you to turn your Bibles to one passage of scripture. We'll go through some others, but we'll just look at one, Exodus 13. We'll just go to one. Uh, All right, I'm going to slow it down just a little bit. I'm going to bring it back to 1.25. Just Exodus chapter 13. And uh, as you're getting to Exodus 13, let me just say this. This is, in my opinion, the most important message in the series. We're in the series called The Blessed Life, 
And this is probably the most important message in the series. The title of this message is The Principle of First. Not the commandment, the principle of first. What's a principle? The principle of first. And I want to make this statement. If God is first in your life. If God is first. If, if, if. This is law. Then everything will come into order. And I'm not saying you won't have difficulties or problems or go through struggles. Jesus said in this world you'll have tribulation. But would you rather go through tribulation with everything in order <laughs> or everything out of order? And hear me, if Jesus is first, if God's first, everything will come into order in your life. And you got to prove that by passing the test, by writing the first check to Gateway Church. If he is not first, then nothing will come into order in your life. God has to be first for there to be order in your life. So I want to show you this principle because this principle is a principle that runs. Principle. Not a commandment, a principle. All through scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. Here, so let's start. Exodus chapter 13, look at verse 1. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and beast, it is mine. It is mine. It belongs to me. I wish that I could adequately explain to you how emphatic the language is in the Hebrew here. This phrase, it is mine. It is. I really don't think you're a Hebrew scholar. My property, it belongs to me. I'm the owner. It's extremely emphatic. It's very important to understand that when we talk about the principle of first. The firstborn, he says, belongs to me. Okay, now look at verse 12. That you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb. That is, every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the males shall be the Lord's. Very similar language in the Hebrew. Now, did you notice that the, uh, the text, he jumped. He jumped from like 1 and 2 all the way over to 12. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply our three rules for ba sound biblical exegesis, which are context, context, and context. Then we're going to take a look at some of the cross-references to see what's going on here. So in Exodus, let me pull this up, Exodus chapter 13, you're going to note that this is right on uh, you know, the heels of the uh, Passover. And so you'll note that when God sends the destroyer through Egypt, that when it comes to the people who survive, they have to have the blood of the Passover lamb on their door. Right. It's a type and shadow pointing to Christ because scripture says Christ, our Passover lamb, has been slain. All of that being said here, there's an ongoing theme here. So the children of Israel had a Passover lamb as their substitute for their firstborn. The, the Passover lambs died rather than the firstborn, whereas the Egyptians, they didn't have the blood of the lamb, therefore their firstborn died. There's a major theme running through here as it relates to the firstborn. So let's take a look at the stipulation of the Mosaic Covenant. This is Mosaic Covenant. We're not required to do this today. That's why Robert Morris is talking in these nebulous terms. Oh, well, this is about the principle of the first. Here's what it says. So Yahweh said to Moses, consecrate to me all the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast is mine. So then Moses said to the people, remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery, for by a strong hand, Yahweh brought you out from this place. No leavened uh, bread shall be eaten today in the month of Abib. You are going out, and when Yahweh brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. So you can see here in the context, the, these who's God talking to? The children of Israel. This isn't a command that, that Christians are bound to obey in any meaningful way today. In fact, we're, I'm going to argue that Christ has fulfilled this as part of his passive obedience to the Torah. So seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the seventh day there shall be a feast to Yahweh. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No leavened bread shall be seen with you. No leaven shall be seen with you in all of your territory. You shall tell your son on that day, it is 
is because of what Yahweh did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be a sign as a sign for your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of Yahweh may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, Yahweh has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statute at its appointed time from year to year. This is commands regarding what? Uh, the, the feast day of Passover, which is part of the Mosaic Covenant. So when Yahweh brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and to your fathers and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to Yahweh all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are male shall be Yahweh's. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb, or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of a man among your sons you shall redeem. And when it is time to come, uh, when in time to come, your son asks, what does this mean? You shall say to him by a strong hand, Yahweh brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. So you're going to note here, there's a required redemption for every human male child that opens the womb. So let's talk about how this then all gets fulfilled. Deuteronomy chapter 15, <clears throat> here's the commands regarding this. Deuteronomy 15, 19, all the firstborn males that are born of your herd and flock, you shall dedicate to Yahweh your God. You shall do no work with the firstborn of your herd, nor shall the firstborn of your, uh, nor shear the firstborn of your flock. You shall what? Eat it. Eat it. <laughs> it becomes a meal. You and your household before Yahweh, your God, year by year at the place that Yahweh will choose. So you get to consume the consecrated clean animals that uh, belong to the Lord. But if it has any blemish, blemish, if it's lame or blind or has any serious blemish whatsoever, you shall not sacrifice it to Yahweh your God. You shall uh, with, eat it within your towns. The unclean and the clean alike may eat it as though it were a gazelle or a deer. Only you shall not eat its blood. You shall pour it on the ground like water. All right, so you can see something going on here, but it, there's more to it. Let's take a look at the book of Numbers. All right, so remember... Uh, the children of Israel, uh, a Passover lamb died in place of the firstborn rather than the firstborn. And God then is going to use this then for the basis of redeeming and consecrating to himself one whole tribe of the Israelites, and that's the Levites. Watch the connections here. Numbers 8, thus you shall separate the Levites from among the people of Israel, and the Levites shall become, shall be mine. And after that, the Levites shall go to serve at the tent of meeting, when you have cleansed them and offered them as a wave offering, for they are wholly given to me from among the people of Israel, instead of all who open the womb, the firstborn of all the people of Israel, I have taken them for myself." Uh, for all the firstborn among the people of Israel are mine, both of man and of beast. And on the day that I struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated them for myself. And I have taken the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the people of Israel. And there's your important text. So God says the firstborn are mine, but rather than taking the firstborn, what does God take instead? The Levites for himself to serve in the tabernacle and then to serve in the temple. And I, I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons from among the people of Israel to do the service for the people of Israel at the tent of meeting and to make atonement for the people of Israel that there be may, may be no plague among the people of Israel when the people of Israel come near the sanctuary. So you'll note then that the redemption shows up in the fact that the Levites are taken for the service to God, not the firstborn. That's the idea behind this. And you'll see also in the Torah that the children of Israel did a census and had to offer a redemption price so that the Levites then would be given wholly to God. So you, you'll note that this is all what? Mosaic covenant. This has no bearing whatsoever on Christians who are under the new covenant. And then I would note then that in the book of uh, Luke, the gospel of Luke chapter 2, 22, we see that Jesus born of the tribe of Judah, the firstborn son to open the womb of the Virgin Mary, 
that he was presented according to Torah. And, uh, and here's what it says, uh, Luke 2, 22, when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. So Jesus was presented according to the Mosaic covenant command. And then there was an offer of a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. This, by the way, had to do with the, the fact that Mary had to be uh, declared ceremonially unclean after the flow of blood of giving birth to Jesus. So that was the required sacrifice. Actually, there are two, uh, two options here. And the fact that they could only offer a pair of turtle doves shows that uh, Mary and Joseph were poor. They were poverty stricken. So you'll note that Christ had to fulfill all of the law. And uh, in order to be our Savior, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't uh, have fallen short in even one of the commandments. And you'll note th- here then that in order for Christ to fulfill this command, Mary and Joseph had to do this for Christ. So when we talk about Christ's perfect, sinless righteousness, we talk about two categories of righteousness, and that is his active obedience to Scripture and the commands of God, as well as his passive obedience. And in this particular case here, Christ is passively obeying uh, the Mosaic Covenant commands and doing so perfectly. So this is all recorded for us. So do we have to do any of this today? Not at all. But why is Robert Morris going here? Well, because he, you know, because he's all about money. So he's created this principle of the first that we're supposed to, to observe and to follow. But the thing is, is that he's he's twisting up the requirements regarding the consecrating of the firstborn, and why they were even consecrated in the first place, how they were actually redeemed in the in the Mosaic covenant, and now and and, and turning this into a part of the most important thing. You got to give. You got to give first, man. You got to give first. And it sounds so pious. But the reality is, is that he is manipulating the biblical text horribly. And you're going to see here shortly, he's going to add to the Bible, and I'll prove it. So let's keep going. Belong to God. They'll be the Lord's. But every firstborn, now we'll talk about this, of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Very important. A donkey will be redeemed with a lamb. Now watch this phrase. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its net. It's very important to understand that if you don't redeem it. Yeah, but those, uh, those, um, <clears throat> those clean animals, they were eaten. They, they, they weren't brought into the, into the temple. They were eaten. You're going to lose it anyway. And I want you to apply that as we talk about the first of our finances, the first 10%. He says, you're, if, you don't, if you don't bring it to me, you're going to lose it. You're... No, no scripture says this. And this is where he just added to scripture. This is one of the places. So no biblical text says, if you don't bring me the firstborn of your, your, your wages, you're going to lose it. No text says that. He's just added to scripture. Listen again redeem it, you're going to lose it anyway. No, no, no biblical text says that. And I want you to apply that as we talk about the first of our finances, the first 10%. He says, you're, if you don't, you don't bring it to me, you're going to lose it. You're still- no scripture says that. Lose it. It's going out of your account. Watch this. And all the firstborn of man among your sons, you shall redeem. All right. So I have three points. If you're taking notes, I want you to write these down. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Now, that's a longer point than I normally have. So Mosaic covenant requirement. We're not under the Mosaic covenant. There is no ongoing uh, requirement here. And if there was, it would have nothing to do with your bank account. It would have to do with your firstborn children and any firstborn livestock that you might own. Make sure and leave it up long enough for you to be able to, to write it down. The firstborn must be. There, there, there is, there, the, I, I, I prayed over this language before, uh, whether I should say it this way. But according to Scripture, the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. That's the principle here in the Old Testament. And those firstborn clean animals were eaten as a meal. It is referring to a principle that goes all through the Bible. The firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Okay, but how do you know which to do? How do you know what? Notice he's talking, he's talking out of both sides of his, of his mouth here. On the one side, he's talking. He's t- talking how this text is talking about animals, but he's he has a double on tundra now going, where that somehow this has some kind of ongoing application to your checkbook 
and it doesn't. You sacrifice it or redeem it. Well, he gives two animals, which are exemplary of categories of animals. He, he, he gives us the donkey and the lamb, okay? The donkey represents unclean animals, and the lamb represents clean animals. So how do you know which to do? Well, if it's a clean animal, it has to be sacrificed, the firstborn. If it's an unclean animal, it has to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean. Right. In both cases, you're eating the clean animal. Let me say that one more time. If it's clean, firstborn. I'm hoping you kind of get ahead of me on this and understand what this represents. If it's a clean and it's firstborn, it has to be sacrificed. If it's unclean, it has to be redeemed with the sacrifice of a clean. Okay. Well, how in the world does this relate to us today? Well, now, here's where he's going to tap into the types and shadows and say something that is relatively correct, because you'll note that each and every one of us were born unclean, dead in trespasses and sins, and Christ is the one who makes us clean. So he's tapping into the, a correct understanding of how the types and shadows work, but this isn't for the purpose of exalting Christ and proclaiming Christ and his redemptive work for us. This is in order to talk about the reason why your finances are cursed if you don't obey the so-called principle of the first. I ask you two, two questions, all right? First of all, were you and I spiritually born clean or unclean? In other words, when we were born in the natural, our spiritual state before God, were we born into this world, were we clean or unclean? Unclean. Unclean. We were all born in sin, right? I can prove it by simply asking the experts here, the parents, did you have to teach your children to be bad? <laughs> or did that come naturally for them? See, we have to teach them to be good. Is that right? Because we're all born with a sin nature. That's, that's what the Bible says, all right? So we were all born unclean. Was Jesus born unclean or clean? Clean, sinless, spotless, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Clean. Okay, listen to me. Listen very carefully. The clean, Jesus, the clean had to be sacrificed so that the unclean could be redeemed. Now that's correct. This part's true. But again, remember the context. That's what we just read. <laughs> that's how important this principle is. Principle. Notice the principle is about you giving money to Gateway Church. And we're going to see that this principle refers to tithing. But no, it doesn't. <laughs> you made that up. No biblical scholar teaches this. I'm going to say something to you that maybe you've never thought of. Jesus is God's tithe. No, he's not. And this is where I'm going to slow everything down to normal speed. No scripture ever says that Jesus is God's tithe. He just added that to the biblical text. And Exodus 13 has absolutely zero, nothing to do with tithing at all. It is not a tithe. So what this fellow is doing is, well, this is like a three-card Monty. Uh, you know, this, this is a scam. He's a, he's a biblical panhandler here peddling uh, a scheme to make money. That's what this is. So let, back, let me back this up just a little and listen again. Jesus is God's tithe. No, he's not. No text says that. Because you see, you give the tithe first. You don't pay your bills and see if you have enough left over to tithe. You give the tithe first. It's the first 10%. It's not just 10%. It's the first 10%. Christians are not under the Mosaic Covenant's command to tithe. We've already established this. Because it takes faith to give the first. See, God Because it takes faith to give the first? You've got to tithe because it takes faith to give the first. No biblical text says this. He's just making this doctrine up out of thin, greedy air. Let me back it up. It's the first 10% because it takes faith to give the first. See, God said, when your sheep has a lamb... Give me the first one. It takes faith to give the first one before you have any more. Uh, he says to consecrate it and then eat it. I don't know if the sheep's going to produce anymore. That takes faith. God didn't say, wait until your sheep has 10 and then give me one of them and you can give me the one that keeps getting in your garden that you don't like. Yeah, this is an argument from silence. This is not exegesis, nor is it a correct application of Exodus 13, which is a Mosaic Covenant command which we're not under. 
No, he said, you give me the first one before you have any others. See, so many people think it's not the 10% that enacts the blessing, it's the faith that enacts the blessing. Mm, Your faith enacts the blessing. What blessing would that be again? I'm not sure what you're talking about. If you're talking about the blessings of the Mosaic Covenant, uh, not even the Israelites kept that covenant and all the curses were uh, put into play. It's giving the first 10%. And the reason I say that Jesus is God's tithe is because God gave Jesus first. To whom? So you're saying Jesus is God's tithe. You made that up. No biblical text says that. Because God gave Jesus first. Like I give a tithe? Did, Did God bring Jesus into the storehouse? What are you talking about? He didn't wait to see if we would clean up or straighten up to give his son. God gave Jesus when we were mocking him and spitting on him and nailing him to a cross. Total misappropriation of Christ's suffering and death here. Jesus is not a tithe. No text says that. Roman says it this way, while we were yet sinners. Yeah, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for our sins. Christ died for us. Mm Mm-hmm. And Romans also said this way, that God gave Jesus in hope. No text says that. Let me me back this up. He just made up a portion of Romans that isn't there at all. And I happen to own a Kindle copy of The Blessed Life, and I'll show you what he does. He's adding to Scripture and saying something that isn't there at all. He just made that part up. And Romans also said this way, that God gave Jesus in hope. No text says that God gave Jesus in hope, but let's let him finish out his, his uh, thought. In hope. And that word, the root of that word is faith. In faith, we give our tithe in faith. So God gave Jesus in hope, but by hope, you mean the Greek word means faith. Now, let's, let me do this here. Let's take a look at the most recent time he preached on the principle of the first. And yeah, he's, he's aged a little bit. Uh, March 19th of last year, 2020. Let's uh, listen as he makes this point again. Maybe you've never thought about this. Jesus is God's tithe. The reason is you don't wait to see if you have enough left over to tithe, you give the tithe first. God didn't wait to see if you would clean up and straighten up to give Jesus his son. God gave Jesus his son when we were mocking him and beating him and nailing him to a cross. While we were yet sinners, Romans says, Christ died for us. And it also says that God gave Jesus in hope That root word in the Greek is the same word, you ready for this, as faith. No, it's not. He's totally lying here. Elpis, the Greek word for hope, is nowhere ever translated as faith. In fact, the Greek word for faith is pistis. That's the noun form. The, uh, The verb form is pistuo. Elpis and pistuo I don't know where you're getting your, your information from, but Elpis is a different word altogether. So we, we got a problem here. We got a big problem. Now, the, the, I pointed out that uh, he said that, uh, that in Romans, it says that God gave Jesus in hope, and the word for hope means in faith. So I just did a Google search. All right, and I typed in, and notice I put the uh, the quotation marks there. God gave Jesus in hope. Have you ever done a search in Google and only come up with eight results? Eight. If there was an actual biblical text in the book of Romans that said that God gave Jesus in hope, then you would have hundreds of thousands of of, of, you know, results. But you're going to note here, uh, God gave Jesus in hope, Robert Morris, Robert Morris, um, let's see, Gateway Church, Robert Morris, Robert Morris, uh, a person who is using Robert Morris's teaching, huh, eight results. And 
seven of the eight are clearly directly connected to Robert Morris. That should be a, um, a red flag here. But I happen to have a copy of the Kindle version of his book, The Blessed Life. So here's what he says. Uh, God gave Jesus in faith, quote, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, Romans 8, 29. Note these words, God gave Jesus in faith. Those are not in the Bible, and they're not in Romans 8, 29. Let's take a look at Romans 8, 29. Okay, so we're going to go to Romans 8, and we're going to apply our three rules for sound biblical exegesis, and we're going to add some context. They are context, context, and context. We're going to add some context. So we're going to back up here. Here we go. We're going to look at some of the hope uh, discussed here in this passage. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, Paul is writing, are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits in eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not it willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. So God subjected the... the um, creation to futility in hope, that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, for the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved." Now, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? And this is the important point here. Does God hope? You have to, God knows the beginning from the end. So we've got a, we've got a theological issue with him claiming that God gave Jesus in hope. In hope of what? Doesn't God know the end from the beginning? For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for, if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Hope is a is a characteristic of Christian faith. You know, the greatest of these are faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. All right. The, the, these are the three that remain: faith, hope, love. Faith in Christ, hope in the inheritance of the new earth, the eternal life in, in Christ, love towards God, love towards one another, right? So, you know, but God, hmm. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings that are too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew... He, God, also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So you'll note here that uh, Romans 8, 29 talks about the biblical doctrine of predestination. Those whom he, what? Foreknew. Those whom he for knew he predestined it to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So let's take a look back at what he does in this book. God gave Jesus in faith, quote, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. False. Romans 8.29 explicitly says that those whom God foreknew, he predestined. There's no exercising of faith on God's part as it relates to giving Jesus, because Romans 8.29 and 30 are talking about the biblical doctrine of predestination and God's foreknowledge. And so what, let's just put it this way. What he is doing here, what Robert Morris is doing in this text, in this passage, is by saying that God gave Jesus in hope, 
I mean, by hope, I mean faith. He is basically gutting Romans 8, 29 of the doctrine of predestination and turning God into Jesus is my tithe in hope and faith that, uh, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That takes that text and turns it on its head. And he added these words, God gave Jesus in faith. And then we just saw in two instances in his teaching on the principle of the first, he's added the words to scripture, to Romans, that God gave Jesus in hope. But there is no biblical text, especially in Romans, that says either that God gave Jesus in hope or gave Jesus in faith. No text says it. He's completely made it up and inserted it in the biblical text. And I'm going to basically argue that what he did here, he did on purpose. You can't twist God's word this badly to make it say the exact opposite of what it says. Romans 8, 29 and 28 and 30, they're all about the doctrine of predestination, and he's turning it into a, a, something about hope, and he added the words, God gave Jesus in hope. You can't twist God's word by accident this way. He went through a lot of pains and in order to make it say what it doesn't say. So I'm gonna back this up again and listen again. Christ died for us. And Romans also said this way, that God gave Jesus in hope. No, Romans doesn't say that, nowhere. In hope, and that word, the root of that word is faith. It, it, mm -mm. The root of that word is faith. Show me from the uh, Greek scholars where Elpis, is, is, is translated uh, as faith. When I do my search in Logos for how Elpis is used in the New Testament, 100% of the time it is used as either hope or expectation, not faith. In faith, we give our tithe in faith. So it's the first 10%. Think about this. When the children of Israel went into the, the uh, promised land, God said, bring all of the silver and gold from Jericho into the house of God. No, actually, that's not what it says. Another text here. We're going to take a look at Joshua chapter 6. Let me find this real quick here. Here we go. Joshua 6. Listen to the command. This is the talking about all of the uh, things set apart for destruction in Jericho. So I'll start in verse 15. On the seventh day, they rose early at the dawn of the day and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city seven times. And at the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout for Yahweh has given you the city and the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to Yahweh for destruction. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing of for destruction and bring trouble upon it. But all the silver and the gold and every vessel of bronze and iron are holy to Yahweh. They shall go into the treasury of Yahweh. It doesn't say house. It says treasury. This is what he just said here is also biblically wrong. When the children of Israel went into the, the uh, promised land, God said, bring all of the silver and gold from Jericho into the house of God. It's always into the house of God. That's always where the tithe goes. But why didn't he say 10? The Jericho's not a tithe. Percent of Jericho. It's very simple because Jericho was the first city. Oh, see, principle of the first. That's the reason why. So he invents the principle of the first, and then he goes to Jericho and says, oh, the reason why they're, that they're, they're devoted to destruction and everything belongs to the Lord is because of the principle of the first. So now he's basically coming up with a motivation for God, and, and it all goes according to this principle that he's discovered. That's simple. He said, bring the first into the house of the Lord, and the rest are redeemed. 
They're out from under the curse. They're blessed. Nowhere does it say that the rest are redeemed and out from under the curse. The first portion has the redemptive, is the redemptive portion. The, please hear me. When you give the first to God, the rest are redeemed. That's what this is saying. So hear me clearly. <laughs> Don't give the first portion to the mortgage company. Yeah, well, you know, all the people in the United States, the first portion goes to the IRS, to the U.S. government. So... <laughs> All of our finances are cursed using your logic and your so-called principle of the first. This guy's slick. If you attend a church that shows this man's money teaching, you know, the, the blessed life as the basis for why you should be giving to the church, you need to leave because you are going to be legalistically pestered and cajoled and manipulated into giving money to that church and being told that your money, your finances, your bank accounts, you're all, it's all under a curse unless you bring the very, 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 very first amount of, your, uh, of, your money, of the money you earn off of your paycheck to, uh, to, the, to the house of the Lord. Because the mortgage company does not have the power to bless your finances. And scripture doesn't say that unless I bring the tithe, that God is going to curse my finances. Again, this is all Mosaic Covenant. And what you're doing with the Mosaic Covenant, you don't even know how it operated. You have no clue how it even worked. You've invented fantasy uh, details regarding the Mosaic Covenant that are not even there. But God does. The first portion First 10% goes to God. So the firstborn must be sacrificed or redeemed. Here's the... Yeah, you get the idea. So the whole basis of this so-called principle of the first is a complete manipulation and twisting of God's word. And he's added to scripture on several different counts, including adding to the book of Romans, uh, words that are not even there. And by adding the words that he did, he completely turns uh, Romans 8, 29 in the opposite direction of what the text says, because that text teaches the biblical doctrine of predestination, not hope or God having faith. And Jesus nowhere in scripture is described of our, as a tithe. So hopefully you found this helpful. If so, all the information on how you can share this video is down below. And if you know anybody that attends Gateway Church or attends a mega church that, uh, that they use Robert Morris's blessed life teaching as the foundation of their uh, doctrine of giving at their church, give them the, you know our uh, understanding of the biblical covenants and then Robert Morris's blessed life debunk it in a part one and part two so that they can see that they are not obligated and their finances are not cursed if they don't if they don't tithe again the tithe is a mosaic covenant command not a new covenant command so uh, again if you found this helpful sh share the video with people and uh, until next time may god richly bless you in the grace and mercy won by jesus christ and his vicarious death on the cross for all of our sins amen <laughs>